Well, it's very good to be with you uh, this evening and uh, get to talk about understanding Genesis. And on the one hand, you might think, well, that seems a little bit trivial in light of all the problems that we have in the world today, because we do have some problems in the world today. Would you agree with that? Okay, yeah, okay. Make sure we're on the same page there. But um, what if I told you there's a connection between understanding Genesis and the problems that we see in the world? I mean, consider the United States of America. We have the most churches and seminaries, the most Christian colleges, the most Christian bookstores, Christian radio of any nation. That's a wonderful blessing. And yet, would you say that this nation, as a nation, is becoming more Christian every day or less Christian every day? Less. How is that happening? How is it that this nation founded on Christian principles, primarily by Christians, despite what the revisionists want to say? How is it that we're becoming a pagan nation at an alarming rate? Uh, what is going on here? And if you think about it, all the problems that we have in this nation and other nations as well can be traced back to a broken law of God. Whenever people do something that is contrary to what the Bible says we're supposed to do, that causes problems. And you think, well, why would people do that? I mean, we've got God's clear instruction book. It's written for our benefit. He didn't do it because he needs anything. He's God. He wrote that for our benefit. These are the rules that we're to live by. Uh, And why would people... Why would people reject that? Well, on some level, they reject the Bible as being the inerrant word of God. And if you think about it, what, what is the most attacked and ridiculed, mocked book of the Bible? It's Genesis. That's the place where people start to doubt because even you know secular archeologists, they'll admit, yeah, there was a King David and we, we got plenty of evidence for that, but come on, creation and, and six days and I mean, come on. And so it's that, that people start doubting the Bible in the first chapter, and then why would, if the Bible can't be trusted in that first chapter, why would you trust the gospel message that, that comes later on? You see, the real issue behind all the problems that we have in the world, it's the same as the creation versus evolution debate. It's really God's word versus man's word. I mean, when you, the bottom line, that's what it comes down to. Who are you gonna trust when there's a conflict between these two? We've got God's word that teaches creation. Man's word is millions of years of evolution is the way that life got here. And if man's word is true, then God's word isn't because they conflict at that point. And so I wanna suggest to you the loss of biblical authority beginning in Genesis is the root of the decline of Christian America. It used to be in this nation, you could say things like abortion is wrong and homosexual behavior is wrong, adultery is wrong, and people would say, of course, I get that. But today, if you try to say those things, they'll say, not according to my rules. In fact, today, it's getting so perverse that they demand that you celebrate all kinds of sexual perversion, and that, and that really is a shame. But that's because that foundation has shifted. You, you can't defend things like abortion and, and sexual perversion if you're standing on God's word because it says the opposite, right? But if you have an evolutionary view, if if we're just animals, animals pretty much do what they want, why shouldn't we? If the evolutionary idea is true, and that's what I mean when I I refer to the term evolution, I'm referring to the the Darwinian idea, slightly modified now, neo-Darwinian idea that that, uh, a single uh, celled microbe eventually, after, as it reproduced over, over millions and millions of years, became everything else, diversified, and so we're all related to a turnip in that view. Now, I, I reject that, but there are people who embrace that view, and that's what I mean when I talk about evolution. I don't just mean change, because we all agree things change, so that's not the issue. Uh, it's, but I don't believe in that kind of change. I do believe animals change, just within certain limits. And if you think about all the Christian doctrines that we hold dear, really they have their foundation in creation, in Genesis, and really in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. It's amazing the amount of theology that's packed into those 11 chapters. Consider uh, the fact that we have laws, for example. Why would we have laws? Well, because God's the creator, right? We learned that in Genesis. We're the creation, and so he, gets the, he has the right to make the rules. God is a linguistic being. He communicates to us. He gave Adam and Eve language. I always thought that was pretty neat that Adam and Eve didn't have to go to grammar school to learn how to speak. They just, God pre-programmed them that way. That's kind of neat. But they were able, there was understanding. God was able to communicate to people. And he told them, here's, here's some things you're supposed to do and here's one thing you're not supposed to do. And he told us what the consequences would be. So the whole idea of laws and punishment when you break a law, what is the punishment when you break a law? Well, if it's, if it's a crime against God, he's the king of kings. And so that's high treason. That's a capital offense. And so we learn that death is the penalty for sin. That goes back to uh, Genesis, or marriage for that matter. We teach that marriage is one man and one woman united by God for life. Where does that idea 
come from? Well, it comes from Genesis because that's what God created. God created the family unit and so he gets to define the family unit. He defines marriage. And that goes back to Adam and Eve. And the Bible specifically says that in, in uh, Genesis 2. For this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's the reason God created it that way. Standards, standards of behavior, standards of clothing. I noticed you're all wearing clothes today. I appreciate that. I'm sure you do too. Uh, where, where did we learn about the origin of clothing? Oh, that's in Genesis, isn't it? Yeah, originally it wasn't that way, but God provided skins of clothing uh, to, to, to cover our shame. Even, even that was an act of mercy and grace. Uh, meaning of life, why is it that human life is so valuable? Why is it that I can't just go out and shoot somebody that I really don't like? Because that person is made in the image of God and therefore deserving of dignity and, and respect. They have value. And so we see, but, but, but where do we learn that human beings are made in the image of God? That's in Genesis chapter one. It's right there at the beginning. Male and female, he made them. Both made in the image of God. And that sets us apart from animals. I think God cares about animals too, but not to the same extent that he cares for those creatures that he made in his image. What a special privilege we have as God's image bearers. Jesus understood this. When Jesus was uh, debating with the uh, religious leaders of his day, they were asking him about divorce to explain marriage. Jesus went back and quoted Genesis one and two as the foundation of marriage. You can read about that in Matthew uh, chapter 19, for example. But you see, today there's another option, isn't there? Because at just about every secular school and university in the nation, we're taught evolution is the way that life came about. And if that were true, and, and you were gonna be logically consistent, there would be some other truths that would follow from that. Why would you have laws, for example, in an evolutionary universe where might makes right, where it's survival of the fittest that determines uh, you know, what, 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 who survives and, and whatnot. If you think about it, laws are anti-evolutionary by their nature because evolution is all about the strong dominating over the weak. That's how it's supposed to progress. Yet laws are designed to protect the weak from the strong. They are anti-evolutionary by their very nature. Or why not do what you want with sex for that matter? Again, if we're just animals, why not do what's instinctive? Why not do what feels right? Or abortion, I mean, if really, if we're just animals, I mean, you would euthanize spare cats, why not euthanize spare kids? And if that sounds dreadful to you, it should, because that's not, that's not the truth, right? But it, it is what would be expected if you were to be logically consistent with an evolutionary foundation. And I'm not suggesting that evolution is the cause of all these social ills. Sin is the cause of those social ills, but I am suggesting that evolution gives people a way to try and justify that sin in their minds. Because you can't defend those evils on a, on a Genesis foundation, it's not gonna work, and vice versa. You can't defend Christian doctrines on an evolutionary foundation. If the whole Adam and Eve thing, if that's just a fairy tale, you can't defend biblical marriage. If Adam and Eve's just a fairy tale, then, then marriage is just a cultural trend. And hey, the culture changes, why shouldn't the definition of marriage change? And that's not a hypothetical issue, that's exactly the argument that's being made by those who wanna, who wanna change things up. So what we need to recognize is that in our culture today, that, that foundation, our foundation's being attacked. The very first book of the Bible, the first 11 chapters, people are saying, that's silly, you can't believe that anymore. And then we try to defend the doctrines that are logically based in that. That's not gonna work out well. But we get intimidated. And it is so easy to get intimidated because there are some bril really brilliant scientists who believe in evolution. I don't deny that. There are some brilliant scientists who believe in creation, by the way. I've had the opportunity to, to meet many such people, and that's a tremendous blessing. But we get intimidated because the majority of scientists hold to an evolutionary worldview, and we think, well, you know, it's got to be true because, I mean, scientists are never wrong about anything, right? I say that tongue in cheek, I hope you know that's a joke. But um, we get intimidated, and so a lot of times Christians will say, well maybe that's the way God did it, right? Because I, I want to be a Christian, I, I want to believe the Bible, maybe God used an evolutionary process. The problem there is, that's not what the Bible says. I mean, when you take a look at Genesis, that's, that's just not what it says. And so some people will say, well maybe Genesis isn't meant to be taken as literal history, maybe it's kind of you know, poetic in nature or something like that. The problem is Genesis is not written in a poetic fashion. I mean, take a look at the, some of these verses that you'd love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so beget so-and-so, and they beget so-and-so, those genealogies, right? Be honest, you skip some of those names, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, those verses are there for a reason. They're there to show us that these are real people that lived, and it tells us the names of at least one of their children, and in many cases, all kinds of incredibly boring information, like how long they lived before the first, you know, the, one of their children, and how long they lived after, and you add it up, and you, what's the total age? So they did know how to add back then. They were not common core educated, apparently. So in any case, um, yeah, this is, this is to tell us that these are real people, right? This is not what you'd have in a parable, because some people say, well, maybe Genesis is like a parable. It's, it's just a story. It's not meant to be literal history. It's just conveying a spiritual truth. That is not the way you'd write a parable. Parables usually don't have specific names at all. It's usually there was a certain man or whatever, and, they, and they're very concise because they make one point. They, they, they uh, teach a spiritual principle by comparing it to something f- that we're physically familiar with. That's not what's going on here. This is very different, nor is Genesis poetic. I mean, that would be a terrible poem, wouldn't it? <laughs> and it's even more obvious if you know something about the Hebrew language where poetry is characterized not by rhyme and meter like it is in English, but by parallelism. It's very, Engl- it's very um, easy to recognize Hebrew poetry because it, it comes in these couplets or sometimes three, I mean, there's, there's several different kinds, but where you'll um, say something and you'll say either the same thing or the flip side using different words like the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. See how it says the same thing using different words? That's Hebrew poetry. And the wonderful thing about that is it carries over in translation into English. You can still recognize it. If it were based on rhyme and meter, it would be lost. The beauty would be lost. And so it's wonderful that God used the Hebrew language to, uh, uh, to write his, at least the Old Testament. And by the way, those genealogies lead up to Jesus Christ. Yeah, you can read about those in Matthew and in Luke. And so there you go. And so, you know, the, the, there's a problem, though, for Christians who say, yes, I believe in Jesus. Praise God, I'm glad you do. But then they say, but I don't think Adam is real. I think he's just a metaphor. But Jesus is descended from Adam. You think, you, you think Jesus is descended from a metaphor? Because Jesus is not a metaphor, right? He's a real person, and if he's not, you're in trouble because you're still in your sins. The Bible itself says that. If he's not raised, you're still in sins. Your faith is in vain. No, it's important theologically that Jesus is descended from a real Adam and so are we all. The Bible says God made from one man or from one blood all nations. We're all descended from Adam and Eve. We're all related to each other, whether you like it or not. We're all related. But that means we're related to Jesus. He's our brother. And uh, that's pretty neat because according to biblical law, only a relative can redeem you. There's a principle called the kinsman redeemer that uh, is, is throughout the Old Testament. It, it, takes someone, it, it takes someone who is of the same blood to, to take your place on the cross. That's what Jesus does for us. He substitutes in as our blood relative. He takes the punishment that we deserve. He pays for it by his blood, which is our blood, you see, because we're all of one blood. The animals, they can't pay for sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verse four, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's what the Bible says. They were used symbolically in the Old Testament to teach the Jews about substitutionary atonement, and they got the point. This innocent animal who has not sinned, dies on your behalf, and you live, you do, who do deserve death because you've sinned against God, uh, you live in its place. There was an exchange there, but it doesn't actually pay for sins. Only Jesus can do that because he's our blood relative. Animals can't because we're not related to them unless evolution's true, in which case that doctrine's gone, right? Because in the evolutionary view, we're related to turnips, let alone animals and everything else. We have that common ancestor, allegedly. So you see, even the gospel message goes back to Genesis. That's where we learn that death is the penalty for sin. Death is an enemy, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15. It was not part of the very good world that God initially created, but was introduced when Adam sinned. And a lot of people think, well, that's not important to the gospel, but it really is in order to understand the gospel. It's, it's because of what Adam did that, I mean, we're, we're born in sin, right? We've inherited that, that sin nature. We, we rebel against God openly of our own free and perverse choices, and we need somebody to come in and change our heart, change our nature, and pay for our sins on the cross. And so, which, which is non-essential to the gospel, the first Adam or the last Adam? Well, in order to understand the gospel, both are essential. You get, I mean, the gospel, the gospel's the good news, right? Now, the good news is that God provides salvation from sin, but that good news only makes sense if you understand the bad news, that you are a sinner and you need someone to step in and, and, pay, for your, and pay, uh, pay for your sins, lest you have to pay for your own sins for all eternity since you've sinned against an infinitely holy God. 
The Bible really is the history book of the universe. It does contain other types of literature. There's, you know, there's the Psalms, which are poetic in nature, and Proverbs and so on, but it's primarily a history book telling us what the events that happened, especially in Genesis and, and the, the Pentateuch. And so um, I, I find that a lot of people like the morality the Bible teaches, but they want to reject the history even atheists like some of the morality the Bible teaches. Thou shalt not murder, they like that one. They don't wanna be murdered, right? Thou shalt not steal, they like that one too. They don't wanna have their wallet stolen. But you see, those moral principles come out of the true history that's recorded in scripture. Why is it wrong to murder? Because human beings are made in the image of God. You see, it goes back to Genesis. You can't separate them. Jesus put it like this when he was speaking to Nicodemus. He said, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? I mean, the Bible talks about both earthly matters like the days of creation, the flood that happened at the time of Noah, and the, uh, the confusion of tongues that happened at Babel, events that happened in earth history. And the Bible talks about heavenly things like salvation or moral, any moral principle for that matter. But if you say, yes, but I'm not sure that I really believe in that Genesis stuff. I'm not sure that those details are accurate. If God didn't get the details right in Genesis, how can you trust that he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? I guess the question is, does God know how to communicate or doesn't he? I think he does. I think any God who can speak the universe into existence can probably write a book. I mean, of the two, that would be the easier task, right? I mean, I've written a few books, but I haven't spoken a universe into existence, so. But we get intimidated, because again, there are very smart people who say, well, you know, it's, no, it's millions of years of evolution, that's how it works. And we get intimidated, and we try, we try to make these two things agree, maybe, maybe to be academically respectable or something, but th these are contrary versions of origins, and in order to make them agree, you're gonna have to modify one of them. And the one you modify is the one you don't really have your faith in. Otherwise, you wouldn't be modifying it, right? Your ultimate standard, you can't modify it because you'd need a greater standard to tell you how to modify it, and then it wouldn't be your ultimate standard. And this is not how Jesus responded in his earthly ministry. The Pharisees and Sadducees, oh, they were masterful at reinterpreting God's word to fit with their traditions, and Jesus would have none of it. He went back to the written word. It is written, have you not read? You realize when Jesus says to the, the Pharisees and the scribes, have you not read, he, he's being sarcastic. We don't think of our Lord that way, but it's true. Of course they'd read it. They hadn't applied what they had read. They weren't believing it. And so um, Jesus put them in their place. And that's, I think that's very interesting. He did it very well. You can think of the culture war that's going on today a bit like these two cities. You've got the city of God, Christianity, based on the Bible, based on biblical creation. God's word is true from the beginning. And then you've got, well, the other main religion, in, in, at least in this nation, the other big one is secular humanism. There are other religions, but secular humanism is the really big one right now that is competing for the minds and hearts of the citizens of this nation. Secular humanism is based on evolution. The idea that human beings are just the greatest things to evolve out of the slime, and there's nobody over us to tell us what to do. We get to determine our own standards. And so naturally, you're gonna see some symptoms come out of that way of thinking, which we've illustrated on those billboards up there. And Christians recognize those are, those are issues. We need to fight against those, and I think we should. We need to point out you know, racism's wrong and abortion, that's, that's not right, and so on. But we're not dealing with the root of the problem. Meanwhile, the secular humanists are smart. They're aiming at our foundation. They're saying, you can't trust the Bible because you can't trust the very first verse. In the beginning, God, that's silly. They, they tell us in the beginning, you know, hydrogen gas, which I think is rather silly, but that's what they say. And so, and the worst thing we could be doing is shooting our own foundation, because there are Christians, and I don't doubt their salvation, but they say, well, we can't, you know, Genesis, it doesn't really matter what you believe about that. Go ahead and add in the evolution. That's just how God did it then the Bible can't be trusted on any matter if it can't be trusted in the first verse, right? So that's the problem. What is the solution? I think it's fine to zap billboards, but we need to do more than that because those issues are just gonna keep coming back and other ones because once you give up the Bible as your foundation, there is nothing to prevent an unlimited spiral into wickedness. There's nothing to prevent it because there's no, there's no objective standard anymore. So we, wanna, we do wanna blow up those billboards, but we also want to uh, 
refute the whole secular worldview, starting right at its foundation in the idea of millions of years of evolution. Yeah, the, the, the secular story, the secular propaganda is that evolution is the scientific view. I, as a scientist, take issue with that. I would say that evolution, it, scientifically, it's nothing but a bankrupt uh, speculation. It does not have good scientific support. Uh, we'll look at some of the science tomorrow night if we're able to come back for that. But uh, I just want to point out now that that's the foundation of secular humanism, and we need to repair the damage that's been done in the minds of people to the creation-based biblical worldview. And I like how this is illustrated, because we're not shooting at the people. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a battle of flesh and blood, right? We're hoping those people will abandon that sinking city, because it is going down, right? I've read the end of the book, God wins. There's no doubt about that. The secular humanists are fighting against an all-powerful God who is beyond time. There's no way they can win, right? But we want to see as few casualties as possible. We want them to jump off and abandon that sinking city and swim over and join us on City of God. We want people to be saved. That's why I do what I do. I'm not really interested, to be honest with you, in just sort of academic arguments. I want people to be saved. That's why we do what we do at the Biblical Science Institute. And so, uh, and I think that's, what we all, you know, all Christians ought to be able to defend the faith to the, to the extent of the, the gifts that God has given you. What about the time scale of creation? There's some controversy there, although there really shouldn't be. The Bible says that God created in six days. It tells us what he did on each of those days. Human beings are made on day six, and from those genealogies you love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, you add up those ages, and you find that God created heaven and earth and whatever's in them. Uh, the, the time between Adam and Christ is about 4,000 years, Christ's earthly ministry, which was 2,000 years ago. Something like 6,000 years ago is when God created everything. And boy, that rubs us the wrong way because in our society, we've all been brainwashed by media, schools, movies, te television, everything that to, to believe that the world is billions of years old. 4.5 billion years is what the secularists believe. And they need that for evolution to sound credible because we all agree evolution is not gonna happen in 6,000 years, but in any case. And, and, and you'll see this in the textbooks too. You know, you'll see you know, the fossils allegedly deposited over billions of years. There, I mean, it's gotta be true, it's in the textbook, right? And I confirmed it on the internet, so it's gotta be true. <laughs> well, by the way, fossils don't come with tags when you dig them up telling you how old they are. They don't. The, you might seen fossils with labels attached to them in museums. They were attached later by someone who was not around when the fossil formed. And I'm happy to talk about things like radiometric dating and, and such like that, but, but my point is we get intimidated and many Christians feel like they need to add in the millions of years to the biblical timeline. Because let's be honest, if you were stranded on a desert island and all you had was the Bible, you'd never get millions of years out of that. Let's just be honest. You say six days and yeah, yeah, a few thousand years, not, not that many genealogies between Adam and Christ. So it, w it certainly wouldn't be millions of years. But we get intimidated and we think we gotta shove the millions of years in there somewhere. Now you can't do it between Adam and Christ for a number of reasons. First of all, that would destroy the genealogies. It wouldn't make sense to say, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and then a million years later they beget so-and-so. That's not gonna work. The genealogy, there's not that many people between Adam and Christ. Um, and, and furthermore, even the secularists admit human beings don't go back 4.5 billion years. Human beings are recent. So that's agreed upon. Exactly how recent is disagreed, but certainly not billions of years. And yet there's only six days before Adam, and so people try to put the uh, millions of years somewhere in the creation week, because that's the only place they can think to do it. And I've heard, I've heard every possible uh, way of trying to do that that you can think of. I've heard some people say, well, maybe the millions of years happens before the beginning. And that's pretty easy to refute, because if the millions of years happened before the beginning, then the beginning wouldn't be the beginning. It would be the much later, right? And that's not what the Bible teaches. It's in the beginning God created heaven and the earth. So time itself has a beginning, and that's when God made heaven and earth. Some people try to put a gap in between verse one and verse two of Genesis. We'll come back to that one in a little bit. There's no evidence for that, by the way, but again, it's a way to try and get the millions of years in there. And we know the guy who invented it. We know Thomas Chalmers, that was his purpose, was to try and get the millions of years into the Bible by putting a gap of time between those two verses. But one of the most common today is to say, well, maybe the days weren't really days at all. Maybe they were vast ages, perhaps hundreds of millions of years each, right? And then, of course, my question is then, why didn't God say that? And some people have said, oh, well, there is no Hebrew word for a long period of time. Well, that's false. There are several Hebrew words for a long period of time, like olam, which means a long period of time. 
So, I mean, God could have said that if he wanted to. He uses the word for day, yom, and we'll come back and talk about that. But my point is, God says six days. There's no contextual indication to think otherwise. Now, some people will say, oh, but the Bible says that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. There it is in 2 Peter 3.8, all right? And it's funny, they only quote the first part of the verse. What does the rest of the verse say? One day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So you see, it cancels that right out. It goes in the other direction. Um, and, and by the way, when you look at this in context, this is not referring to the creation days. When you look at it in context, it's referring to God's patience in delaying judgment so that many people can be saved. It's explaining why God is so patient, because he is beyond time. And that's the way to read the verse. Now, God can step into time and do things, but because God is the creator of time, he's not bound by it as we are. We can anticipate the future, but we don't know it. God knows it. He declares the end from the beginning. So it's not giving you permission to change the word day everywhere you see it in scripture to a thousand years. And by the way, that would make the earth 12,000 years old instead of 6,000. It doesn't get you anywhere close to the, to the billions of years. The Hebrew word for day is yom. It's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament of the Bible in singular and plural form. The plural form is yamim. And why is it that we only question what a day is in Genesis? Isn't that true? Do people have Bible studies talking, debating about other days in scripture? Like how long was Jonah really in the belly of the great fish? Oh, I think they were ordinary days. Oh, I think they were three, you know, a thousand years each. He was probably in there for a very long time, right? No wonder he repented, right? <laughs> or how long did Joshua really take to march around the walls of Jericho? I mean, it, you know, it says days, but you know, they might've been millions of years, right? He might've been going around there for, for a long time. We understand that. There's, see, there's no confusion anywhere else. It's the same word, yom. There's no confusion anywhere else. And people say, oh, but the Hebrew word yom can mean a, a period of time longer than a day, and that's true when it's used in a non-literal context, in, in, a, in a poetic sense. It's also true of our English word for day, by the way. It's, it's, the parallels are amazing. You might say back in my father's day, oh yeah, that would be a period of time longer than 24 hours, right? It wouldn't be millions of years, but yeah, we get that. Day, our word day can be used for a longer period of time. So what about this? Back in my father's day, it took three days to drive across Texas during the day. Now you've got the word day used three times and I'll bet you didn't have any trouble understanding it because you used context, yes. Most words have more than one meaning. It's amazing we can communicate. How do we do it? Context. In a well-constructed sentence, only one meaning for each word works, and it's the same with, with Hebrew. So, I mean, here you have, you know, back in my father's day, yeah, that would be a longer period of time. Three days, well, those would be ordinary days, those would be earth rotations, right? Because it's, you know, three days, that, that's, that wouldn't be long periods of time. Uh, during the day, that would be the light portion of an ordinary day. The Hebrew word has the same range of meanings, really, uh, and so when we take a look at Yom, outside of Genesis 1, where we all agree what it means, we find when it's used with a number, like the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, it always is translated as a day and very clearly means an ordinary day in all the historical narrative sections of scripture. Of course, if I said on the third day, you went up to such and such a city, you know I'm talking about the third day. We get that. Evening and morning together. Even if the word day isn't there, what's an evening plus a morning? It's a day. Those are the boundaries of a day, right? That happens 38 times outside of Genesis 1. We all agree that's an ordinary day. Uh, evening, and or evening with day or morning with day, either one. So if I said there was evening that day, you'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day. Or if I said there was morning that day, you'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day. That happens 23 times each outside of Genesis 1. It's very clear that's an ordinary day. Or if day is contrasted with night. If I said there was day, then there was night. You'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day. So these are contextual clues that indicate that day is being used in its literal primary sense of an earth rotation or the light portion thereof. So you got it, day with a number, evening and morning together, evening with day or morning with day, or day contrasted with night. So let's take a look at Genesis 1 in context and see if we can figure out what God meant when he said he created in six days. So Genesis 1 verse five, and God called the light day, so there he's defining it for you, days when it's light out, that's an ordinary day. And the darkness he called night, you have night contrasted with day, it's gotta be an ordinary day. You've got evening associated with day, that's gotta be an ordinary day. And you've got morning associated with day, that's gotta be an ordinary day. You've got evening and morning together, which constitutes an ordinary day, and you've got a number with it. Any one of those would indicate an ordinary day. God used all of them. That's amazing. What about the other days of creation, though? What does he say? Evening, morning, number, day. 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 It's pretty clear, isn't it? 
It's almost as if God's trying to say, see their ordinary days, and in case you still don't get it, the ordinary days, and in case you're a little thick, the ordinary days, and in case you're really intellectually challenged, their ordinary days. <laughs> it's very, very clear. I'm gonna skip some of these for time's sake, but I do wanna mention the Martin Luther quote. Back in Martin Luther's time, there were some people who were trying to squeeze the days of creation into one day. It's the same error, but in the opposite direction that people make today. And Martin Luther responds to this by saying, how long did the work of creation take? When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any common according to which six days were one day. And I love this last part. He says, but if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> it's a great quote. What about a gap between verse one and verse two? Well, I'm running a little short on time. I'm gonna do this kind of quickly, but basically the Hebrew grammar does not allow for it, okay? Uh, this is Genesis one in Hebrew. Now Hebrew reads right to left. It's the opposite of English. Verse two uses a grammatical construction called a vav disjunctive, and that's where you have and, the word and, which is a single letter in Hebrew, followed by a non-verb. In this case, and the earth. Earth is not a verb, it's a noun, right? So that's a vav disjunctive. And when you have that in Hebrew, it indicates that um, that is a comment or clarification of what preceded it. Okay, so verse two, it's kinda like what we'd use parentheses for in English. So in the beginning God created them in the earth, parentheses, and the earth was without form and void. Verse two is describing the conditions that existed when God first created it. Because if you didn't have verse two, and you just had verse one, in the beginning God created them in the earth, you might think, oh, he made it like it is today, full of people and full of trees and everything. Verse two is clarifying, no, when God first made it, it wasn't like that, and he took the six days to, to, to make it suitable for life. And so that's, again, that's a vav disjunctive, and uh, the rest of Genesis is vav consecutive, that does follow in time, but you can't, you can't put a gap of time between verse one and two, because verse two doesn't follow in time. It's a clarification of verse one. Uh, what about the science? We'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. What about the theology, though? Because, th see, what happened was the secularists came in, and th they were the ones that argued for the millions of years initially, and many of them were very, they were very open about their motivations. They didn't want the science of geology to be contaminated by Moses, by which they meant Genesis, the books of the, the Bible. And a lot of the theologians, well-intentioned, said, well, you know, maybe we can allow for that because it's not a salvation issue. And, and I agree in the sense that um, nobody's claiming you have to believe in six days to be saved. We're, we're saved by grace, received through faith in Christ alone. Nothing, and, and God doesn't require us to have perfect theology, and that's, praise God for that. That being said, I don't think we should continue to live in sloppy theology after salvation. We ought to, out of gratitude for salvation, get our theology as right as possible. And so there are, one of the main reasons that I want to show you why we don't want to add in the millions of years is because it puts death before sin. You realize that? If fossils are hundreds of millions of years old, you got fossils before human beings existed, let alone before Adam sinned. He didn't even exist, because even the secularists agree human beings don't go back 100 million years. But doesn't the Bible say that death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin? Isn't it very clear on that? You see, even if you don't believe in evolution, but you say, but I think maybe God created over hundreds of millions of years, you got a problem because you got death before sin. And you can't have it both ways. You can't, you, the millions of years says by death came man. The Bible says by man came death. Those are logically contrary positions. They cannot both be true. And frankly, didn't God call the world very good when he first created it? And by the way, it wasn't just the Garden of Eden. Take a look at Genesis, uh, the last uh, verses of chapter one, and God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Everything God made was very good. Hmm. But if there was already death in the world, and, and, and carnivorous activity, animals ripping the guts out of other animals, and so on, and, and disease, cancer, you know we find bones with evidence of cancer and arthritis in them that evolutionists think are hundreds of millions of years old? If those were already in the world, when God called it very good, you got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of billions of years worth of death, struggling disease, bloodshed, and so on. And by the way, one worldwide flood would account for the bulk of the fossils that we find in the world today, so that's not a problem. It's, it's not the Garden of Eden that was on top of the fossils, it's the fossils that are now on top of the Garden of Eden. It's the reverse, because it was, it, was, um, it was covered, as all the world, world was. And some people say, well, I think it's just human beings, but no, no. Animal death, too, because when, when Adam and Eve sinned, God provided skins of clothing. Where did those come from? Yeah, God sacrificed an animal or animals to provide those skins for Adam and Eve. 
Why do animals have to suffer when it was Adam that sinned? Because Adam was given dominion over the world, over the creatures of the earth. And we understand that, right? We're, we're, we're under the authority of our government, for example, and so when our government does something stupid, we all suffer as a result of it. We understand this principle. Um, it's not hard. What about plants? You gotta have plant death, right? Well, plants, biblically, are not considered alive. Did you know that? The, the uh, Hebrew word for life, nefesh, it applies to human beings and it applies to animals. It's never used to plants. Plants are never referred to as nefesh kai, as living creatures. Isn't that interesting? Biologists classify them as living because they're using a different system. That's okay. But um, biblically, plants can't really die because they're not really alive in the first place. And we sort, of, we sort of get that, right? You know that plants are in a different category. If you come across a so-called dead plant, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you know, that's nice. Sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it, put it over the mantle. That's nice. If you come across a dead animal, you say, well, that's nice. I think I'll sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it. That's different, isn't it? We recognize animal death as an intrusion into a world that was once perfect. But, um, I mean, I could imagine that in the eternal state. But there won't be that in the eternal state, right? Because God's going to uh, make the world very good again. You see, the church is teaching a message, and it's the right message. It's uh, come to Jesus, come to the cross, and be saved. That's the message that we want to teach. And that's right. That's the gospel. There's been an attack in the form of millions of years. That's one of the attacks on the gospel. We don't recognize that as an attack, though, because it impacts, and we think, oh, you know what? Um, that's a miss, right? That didn't hit the cross. Millions of years, not a salvation issue. What we fail to recognize is that millions of years is an attack on Genesis, and Genesis is foundational to the gospel. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Death being the penalty for sin, that's in Genesis. It's reiterated later in the scriptures, but its foundation is in Genesis. See, Satan is crafty, and if he were aiming at the cross, saying, oh, there was no resurrection, we would recognize that. That's a problem. You can get books to defend the resurrection. We understand that's a salvation issue, and it is. But Satan's crafty, he aims at our foundation, and we think it's a side issue, but really it's, a, it's an issue of ultimate authority. Is the Bible really the inerrant word of God? I say that it is, and I say we can trust it on every issue. And so then these other attacks came. Naturalism, evolution, eight men, millions of years, no global flood, they all impact. And again, we think, well, that's a miss, didn't hit the cross, but really it was a direct hit, and the result of all these different attacks on Genesis really is unbelief. That's, that's, what, that's what happens, just as Jesus predicted. If you, don't, if you reject one part of the Bible, you're gonna start to reject other parts as well. And then these symptoms happen, you know, prayers outlawed in schools, and that bothers us. And we, well, trust in Jesus, which we should do, but we're, we're not maybe dealing with the problem. Newsflash, creation outlawed in schools. Jesus is gonna return. Well, yes, he is, but he's told us to do some things in the meantime, like make disciples of all nations and be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks a reason of the hope that's in us with gentleness and respect. The Bible's outlawed in schools. We don't like that. Well, let's get the Bible back into schools. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm all for doing what can be done on political grounds, but my point is if the culture's gonna be one to Jesus, it won't be through politics, right? A lot of times people think we just get the right guy in office, well, then an evil population will vote him out in the next term anyway, right? It's, it's got to be ground up. So, Ten Commandments outlawed in schools, and, and well, let's focus on worship. The church can be doing a lot of good things, but if we're not defending the faith from the beginning, uh, th this is the way that I see the culture today. The gospel message has be become obscured by unbelief. People don't want Jesus as Savior because they don't think they need a Savior because they don't understand the problem because they they've rejected Genesis. Right? If you don't understand you're a sinner, then why would, I, why would I need to be saved? That's why I founded the Biblical Science Institute. We come alongside the church. I'm a member of my own church body, of course, but as a parachurch ministry, we come alongside and repair the damage and show you you can trust in Genesis. My specialty as a scientist is I show how the science uh, lines up with Genesis and not so much with evolution. But then when these different attacks come, we wanna warn you, these are attacks on the Christian faith. And then we show you how to refute all those different issues, you see, and that's why we have the various resources that you'll see out back. And then ultimately, we'd like to be in the background. We'd like everybody in the church to recognize these are attacks on the Christian faith and then to uh, be able to refute them soundly, logically. So that's why we exist. And then the church can preach the gospel. Come to, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And people say, oh, I get it now. I get it. I, I'm, I'm, I was born rebelling against God, desiring evil and, and freely choosing to, to rebel against God because I inherited that nature. That's why I need a savior. It goes back to the beginning. It goes back to Genesis. 
Um, a lot of the information that I presented today you can get on our website, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. And I wanna briefly mention that we do have some resources in the back that you might uh, take a look at. This presentation, a little, little longer version of it actually, Understanding Genesis, we have that on DVD if you'd like to get that. And the book that goes along with this, Understanding Genesis, and it, goes, it covers what I covered today, but, but other things as well. And I, I know that sometimes I talk too fast, yeah, but I wrote the book really slowly, so you can take your time with it, and yeah. <laughs> uh, if you want a bulletproof argument for creation, here it is. I wish every student would get this before they went off to college. We might have some different experiences. Uh, we have that on DVD as well, Ultimate Proof of Creation. Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky. You got a beautiful place here for stargazing, and this book is gonna show you how to enjoy the night sky from a Christian perspective. It's a fun resource. If you want more of an apologetic book that refutes the, the Big Bang in the billions of years, taking back astronomy, I'll be talking about this tomorrow night if you're able to come back. Uh, lots of great resources there. Uh, introduction to Logic, this is one of my newer ones. Learning how to think properly. Very helpful, especially in apologetics, but frankly, in every aspect of your life, and it's not something that's taught in most public schools. I think there's a reason for that. There's a teacher's guide too if you wanna use it as a homeschool curriculum. Uh, the Get Logical, um, this is a Sunday school series. I, did, I, I went through the book in a series of 10 uh, Sunday school lessons with my home church and we recorded those so you might wanna use that with, with, uh, with your church perhaps. Uh, cre uh, create Cosmos, all, all kinds of wonderful research. Dinosaurs is a fun one too and that's one that even the, the youngsters really like that one. They like dinosaurs. So there's some of the uh, fractals. We have that now in hardcover. You're the first people to have access to the hardcover version. We don't even have that on the website yet. So if you wanna get that, um, it, this is neat, and I don't even wanna spoil it by talking too much about it, but it goes along with the DVD called The Secret Code of Creation. It shows how God has built beauty into an aspect of creation that you never even thought about probably, and I, I dare say there is no secular explanation for what you're gonna see on that DVD or Blu-ray or read in that book. It is really amazing and beautiful. You can get the best of our books together for a 20% discount. You can get the best of our DVDs for a 20% discount or the best of everything. This is our library pack. That's for a 30% discount. We only do that for conferences like this. You can get the individual resources over the web, but if you want the discount, uh, you can check that out tonight. We have some wonderful children's resources as well. Children are gonna get hammered with this stuff. It's becoming more and more prevalent. So make sure that they are equipped. I highly recommend uh, these resources. We have a monthly newsletter. It's an electronic newsletter, so you'll get it in your email. If you don't put your email address, you'll get nothing, okay? Um, so sign up for that, please. It is totally free, we just wanna bless you. So not too many things free in this world, just salvation and our newsletter. So there you go, and then check us out on the web as well. And let me go ahead and close in prayer. And I wanna thank you for having me out to speak. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, evening and thank you for, that your word is true from the beginning and can be trusted in all matters. And I pray that this message is encouraging and uh, just, it just uh, fill us with confidence and boldness to proclaim your word in all circumstances. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.